Hi again, this is Dwight. Today we're going to talk about the economy of the United Kingdom, or more correctly, the United Kingdom of Britain and Northern Ireland. It's very apropos that this is early in the semester in that we've discussed the uh, Industrial Revolution beginning in the UK in the 1800s. But there's also, you know, Adam Smith's the, the, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, often just called the wealth of nations in 1776. Written by the Scottish natural philosopher Adam Smith is seen as the foundation of modern economic theory. Uh, and this book, or the ideas in this book, led Britain to move away from a system of mercantilism, which was largely looking at trade as a way of enforcing power at home, or increasing power at home, as something that was more interested in economic development. It also crucially led to the development of the modern factory system. If you read The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith's pin factory uh, example in there, is something that uh, prefaced or presaged, if you will, the idea of the modern factory system and a division of labor. Britain, in its early years, benefited enormously from its status as an ocean-going nation. Uh, famously, the Queen's uh, dictum was that Britain should have a navy large enough that it was twice all of their opponents combined. And that, led, that sea power led to ocean-going trade routes that, that happened worldwide and, of course, you know, the formation of the British Empire, upon which the sun never set. And then British science and technology, as a result of the Industrial Revolution, played a, a leading role in the development of not only the British economy, but later the, the global economy as well. You remember, perhaps, that graph from Angus Madison that showed that income on a per capita basis was absolutely flat for 5,000 years till it comes up to just about 1820, and then it starts trending upwards, and that, from that point on it becomes asymptotic. And that graph says everything you need to know about industrial development, that uh, it and, and only it has led to an increasing standards of living. So, as an, also as an early industrializer, uh, you need to understand that Britain had very little need for tariffs and that they were the leading manufacturer of pretty much everything at the time of, of we started this first era of, of globalization, as you, can, you might refer to it. So, <clears throat> we had uh, increasing use of labor power. You had, therefore, uh, this massive in-migration of people from the rural areas into the cities, the development of, of London as a megalopolis. All this came as, as a result of this idea of industrialization. British capital was from an early stage massively invested overseas to a far greater extent than any other industrialized country or even at any other industrializer. But this arguably contributed to Britain's comparatively limited investment in its own domestic economy. Uh, you remember the great British, uh, the, uh, the, the great British trading companies with uh, f uh, royal patents the East India Company, for example. Uh, these companies, the Hudson Bay Company, which is now uh, just called The Bay and is one of, one of the oldest companies in the world. Uh, what these did was to put trade in, you know, in, in, in the hands of a few, but it was also keeping everybody else out. In the mid-1800s, about 1851, the Great Expedition, the Great Exhibition is much trumpeted in, in British history, as it should be, because it advanced the idea of British industry, British innovation, British entrepreneurship. But the thing is, 25 years after the start of the Industrial Revolution, a lot of other nations were catching up, in particular France, Germany, and the nascent United States. Uh, it's an interesting example of the penalties of going first, which is something we should probably talk about later in the term. So perversely, once export-driven competitors reemerge re in the form of Germany and, and Japan, UK appears to have been in a disadvantage because of its early industrialization. Because success at one technique or technology leads you to discard innovation. It's called the Icarus Paradox. The skills that got you in the first place are those same skills that are likely to cause you to decline in the future. <clears throat> 
that you've flown too close to the sun. The second Industrial Revolution produced only a handful of British firms or on anything like the scale of companies in the United States, Germany, and later Japan, you know, the great trading companies, the Kiritsus, the, uh, the, the, the German central, uh, centralized companies. And what happened then, of course, you know, is, is the, the various world wars broke out. Uh, Britain was on the winning side of them, you know, fortunately. However, they were still massively uh, affected by them. In fact, in, in, in World War II, the UK suffered half a million casualties amid widespread destruction of domestic industries, and that was a hard uh, blow to recover from. But there was, there was widespread acknowledgement at that time that a little bit of planning, that coordination, economic coordination, helped in, in both world wars to, to lead us to victory. Uh, Lend lease, you know, where America was providing the armory for the world, which I mentioned last week. In the UK sense, uh, John Maynard Keynes and his followers were able to argue that we planned our way through the war. Now let's plan the peace. And that led to the establishment of, of this national managerial capitalism model, the CME model, but also led to the establishment of the welfare state. But although Britain had the nascent idea of a, of a coordinated um, economy, it really never took, it, it never went through that full route the way that other countries have. Because there was always this entrepreneurial spirit in the UK that would have prevented that kind of happening. But the new government under Clement Attlee at, at the end of World War II began building the modern welfare state as we know it today. So they had state coordination of the economy, the occup occupation of what Stalin called the command, or what Lenin called the commanding heights of the economy. That is, we had centralized welfare pr uh, pr provision, national technocratic industrial policy, and s some firms, those of strategic importance, such as coal, steel, some of the banks, the railroads were all nationalized. Conservatives and labor roughly agreed on the basis of full employment, Keynesian demand management, and the welfare state, hence it was titled The Age of Consent. Interestingly, though, many authors trace beginnings of long-term sickness of the UK to this point, and I think I would be in agreement there. Uh, as we get to it later, the British government got so heavily involved in national planning that it took it to an absolute ridiculous level. But one major problem that the UK has always suffered from is relatively low levels of skill at the workplace level. One of the ways you can look at this, if you look at the three, you know, at three of the major industrial economies, the Germans have the best educated middle ranks of any country in the world. Uh, their so-called high school dropouts go to what's called the, you know, the, the Technische Hochschule, which basically means they're studying engineering. And these are the folks that didn't go to university. Whereas the Japanese have the bottom third that is the best educated in the world, which is how they're able to do quality management on, you know, on, on the shop floor level. And in the United States, we went to the top third and have the best educated top third of the workforce in the world, which generates the innovations that happen. Britain was all over the map on this. And that not having that skill level at the shop floor has always been a, you know, a problem for the British economy, which has led to a widespread uh, lack of, of industrial capacity, and it's haunted the country for decades. Another part of the problem, though, was that it was still possible, or it's still hard to get access to capital, because remember, the British were spending all of their capital abroad. I mean, up until 1999, a big, it, was, it was said that every dollar in the world during the course of a single year, passed through the British colony of Hong Kong. So a lot of the British money was invested there. So symptoms of this British disease, afflicting manufacturing, were emerging rapidly. Uh, the British disease also had, the, ha, had something in common with the so-called Dutch disease, which we'll talk about later. But what the Dutch disease was, was that after the discovery by the, the Netherlanders of gas offshore, that what happens is that capital flows to this export industry, but that export industry also raises the, the, the value of the currency. When the British discovered North Sea oil in, in the 50s, and 
started really producing it in the 60s and 70s. That led the pound to be overvalued, which means that other British exports were, you know, were, were hugely expensive. Because in order to buy British oil, you have to convert your local currency into British pounds. Hence, the idea of this British disease. So we had overmanning, we had restrictive practices, low investment, low productivity, and poor management, which is not a good combination. And the Keynesian demand management policy involved owning and running large parts of the commanding heights, as I mentioned. But that made it vulnerable to inflationary pressures, which of course occurred in the 1970s. Uh, after the Arab oil shocks, you know, when OPEC finally got their, their, their shit together, oil prices tripled almost overnight. And that external shock to the economy triggered hyperinflation. Well, not hyperinflation, but it triggered what's called stagflation. Under Keynesian economic theory, you cannot have, as I mentioned last week, high unemployment, high interest rates simultaneously. Yet, that's, you know, that's where Britain found themselves in the 70s. But in, in, in 1964, the, the Wilson government, uh, a labor government, embarked, em, embarked on a massive uh, program of nationalization of industries. But inflation ran out of control in 1973, 1976. What happened is that Britain in, in 76 had to apply for an IMF emergency loan, which is the first time a major European power had to apply for one. The final crunch point was that Labor's attempt of a state-managed economy was also called the Winter of Discontent from 1978 to 79. Uh, the, the coal miners had once again gone on strike and, and were bringing down another government. On the other hand, this led to the election of the Thatcher conservative government in 1979. Thatcher immediately abandoned the rather rudimentary incomes policy and embraced free markets, including removing currency exchange controls. Uh, Thatcherism... I would argue, your author won't, that I, I believe it saved the Western world, but that's something that we should probably discuss, you know, in class. Uh, when, when the UK entered the 1980s, I mean, when, when Thatcher was elected, straight line projections showed that within 20 years, Britain would have the lowest GDP per capita of any country in Europe, except for Albania, if they kept on their current path. That's just frightening when you think about it which is what gave Thatcher all of the impetus she needed to launch on her sweeping reforms. It was a kind of shock therapy. Harsh mentioned that was unpopular, but I think it was necessary. Uh, some people say that it was unnecessarily draconian, that she did this out of personal animus. I, want, for one, don't share that, that view. I truly do think that the only way to in introduce these kind of economic reforms is all at once. I mean, it's the whole Band-Aid kind of thing. You keep peeling it off the pain keeps hurting, and eventually the people will vote you out of office. If you do it all at once, it's done. I mean, it can't be undone to a certain extent. I mean, uh, the, 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 a succeeding labor government tried to undo some of that, particularly under Gordon Brown, but they weren't terribly successful in, in, in trying to do anything else. You know, they weren't able to renationalize things. They you know, weren't able to protect, you know, cradle to the grave uh, welfare. All those kind of things were going probably for good. So what happened is most of the, from 1979 to 1997, most of the post-secondary World War managed state apparatus disappeared. All that stuff, you know, some of that stuff that came out of Bretton Woods was all, now gone. Of course, remember Nixon famously in 1971 took America off the gold standards, which kind of made Bretton Woods you know, irrelevant, except of course for the IMF and the World Bank. But also at that time, the UK distanced itself during the Thatcher years from the EU and started to most re closely reflect what is now called, rather dismissingly by the French, and particularly the Anglo-Saxon or the LME model. The British government abandoned its commitment to demand management. Uh, Keynesian demand management uh, has, has shown itself prone to inflationary spikes. But the central aim was to tackle inflation, and there's only one way of doing that. You need to spike interest rates. You take the interest rates into stratospheres. You remember that uh, Paul Velker, who was Reagan's Treasury Secretary, did it when, when Reagan became president, spiked the interest rates. And what happens is you squeeze investment. And by doing so, you squeeze inflation out of the economy, but also dramatically ups the unemployment rate. 
So both, you know, Thatcher and later Reagan were both faced with this idea of more and more people out of work because of their direct policies. I still argue that it had to happen. Here in Australia, Keating, you know, is still widely derided for the uh, recession we had to have. He was right about that. And, you know, it's one of the few places I'm, I'm going to give Paul Keating full credit. Uh, it had to be done. That's the only way to get inflation out of the economy. And if you don't think inflation is, you know, is terrible, Zimbabwe. <laughs> Look at Zimbabwe. Look at Argentina when it had hyperinflation. Germany, uh, post-World War I. Inflation is a genie that you have to keep under control or it will strangle your economy to death. So, trade union rights were heavily curtailed. Uh, the, I, the, uh, the, the massive public showdown between Arthur Scargill and, and, and the coal miners union and Maggie Thatcher. You may turn if you like, but the lady is not for turning. That was terribly important to get the government policies under control, to be able to privatize the coal industry. Because at the time, as I recall, coal in Britain was three times more expensive than what you could buy it from Germany, for example. The other thing that happened in 1986, Thatcher uh, had her big bang reforms, uh, significantly deregulated the city of London. Uh, the city of London is an interesting anachronism. Technically, it's not part of London at all. It is actually a, a, a duchy. But we'll go into that some other time. It's just a, a historical curiosity. But the city of London is still one of the world's leading financial centers. It's up there with uh, New York, uh, Hong Kong, and, and of course now Singapore. So institutional investors now became you know, the, the, the power holders in, in the British economy. Mainstream economic thought essentially finds in favor of Thatcher's policies. You need to keep that in mind. I mean, the Keynesians, the Keynesians have reemerged again after the GFC, but very few people are, you know, except for the fringe, are willing to argue that what Thatcher did was inherently wrong. But state unemployment was crowding out you know, the private sector. State investment was crowding out the private sector. And state-owned state industries inherently are inefficient largely because they pursue political goals, not economic ones. I mean, that's just a simple, basic kind of truism, if you will, of every country in the world. State-owned industries do not tend to pursue economic goals, except in very limited circumstances. They pursue political ones. Thatcher left office in 1990. She was actually shoved out by her own uh, party. And the party was in political decline. I mean, they'd been on top for a long time. Uh, and when, when, when Thatcher went out, th there was an upswing in the economy in the mid-1990s, but by that time, the, you know, the amendment had swung. Pendulum swing in politics. You need to keep that in mind. And new labor came in uh, uh, became the, you know, in charge at that point in time. Tony Blair ran a brilliant campaign and reformed his party. Uh, it was not called New Labor or the Third Way after uh, some... some some ideas that came out of uh, the Scandinavian countries. They embraced the notions of post-industrial society, post-modern economy, consider financial engineering, publishing, architecture, design, advertising, consulting. Those kind of things, you know, that happen in, in pretty much all of the Anglo countries, here, here in Australia as well. The new labor and government also invested heavily in the public sector, such as education, health, and social care. So they were having a bob each way, basically. And it worked for quite some time because they never got rid of that infrastructure that, that Thatcher had put in place, of letting the economy do what the economy does best. But they had low unemployment combined with low inflation. Blair won another victory in 2001, a narrow one in 2005, and things were going swimmingly. And this idea of shareholder value became increasingly dominant throughout you know, the, the decade of the 90s. Uh, Britain was on a boom, and, and it, it, it worked well. British employers' records developing high-performance work systems tend to be weak. However, we still have that same problem, the British disease. British organizations tend to favor strong levels of managerial control and very limited autonomy. But remember, we were going through a transformation then. Uh, under the new Labour governments of 1997 to 2010, manufacturing declined from 4.1 million to 2.6 million jobs. And the share of GDP constituted by industry declined from 18 to 13 percent. 
but it still retains some powerful firms in manufacturing, especially in higher grade, higher value added goods. The high end of the market is where the money is. I mean, pretty much all of the Anglo countries have offshored, you know, the, the, the bottom end of the industrial economy to China, Taiwan, the Philippines now, Malaysia, Indonesia. If you're going to manufacture something that's, you know, that, that, that's cheap, you don't want to do it with uh, labor that, you gotta, that has a high cost. But the subprime crisis that came along revealed the British economy was massively dependent on debt and public sector employment. Those increases in public sector employment came back to bite the British uh, people quite heavily. Uh, Brown's government stumbled into seemingly inevitable electoral defeat in 2010. He was also trying to undo some of Thatcher's reforms. Uh, as a good Scottish Labour member, he was much more left-wing than Blair ever thought of being. But the conservative Liberal Democrat coalition immediately made major cuts to public spending when they got elected uh, in 2010. The emergency June 2010 budget slashed the budgets of almost all government departments by 25%, something that's probably unheard of in a modern industrial economy. But you know what? It worked. Uh, the British economy came through the GFC, I think, in considerably better shape than most others. So we have this new age of austerity now. But the question is, where will the growth come from in, in the future? I mean, the British economy has stabilized, but uh, one of the big questions that we frequently ask is, where is Google? Where is the European uh, Apple? Where is the European Microsoft? Back to the matter is, you know, except in limited things like, you know, in, in Scandinavia, they, <clears throat> they don't exist. And that's going to be a big problem. But, you know, Britain is still one of the world's leading financial centers. But what else is really happening there? Where is the growth going to come from? Uh, now that we've gone through the dot-com boom, bust, boom. So I don't really know is, is, the, is the interesting uh, answer here. I'm not sure where future growth will come from in Britain. Hopefully, you know, the British entrepreneurs, you know, the, these people who created the Industrial Revolution still have that same spirit, you know, and I think they're still there. But I just don't know where, what direction that's going to come from, where those new industries are going to emerge. So what happened is Britain had this fascinating uh, journey from, many, you know, from this idea of mercantilism to, you know, standard capitalism, you know, from Smith's ideas. Then we had the Industrial Revolution. We had this massive uh, globalization that happened uh, up until World War I. Then we had that, that decline post-World War I. After World War II, we had these ideas of this almost coordinated market economy. But we had the creation of the modern welfare state. We had the nationalization of industries. We had the occupation of the commanding heights. We had the Thatcherite years, which brought back this idea of, of, of free market capitalism. And now we're not sure where we are. But, you know, for the Brits, it's been a fascinating journey. And I'm really not terribly worried about the British economy. I think they'll find their way, as they always have. But it's going to be interesting to watch. So stay tuned. See you again soon. Bye-bye.